Iraq has been in crisis so long, it's hard for anyone to remember any time when it wasn't. The country's had a tumultuous history in the 20th century, including six military coups before the Ba'ath Party seized power in 1968 and kept it. The cruelty of the government toward its citizens was legendary. An estimated 130,000 civilians have died since Saddam Hussein was deposed in 2003, and the number keeps rising. Despite efforts since then to build a more representative government, Iraq has repeatedly fallen into sectarian violence. What is the nature of this country that seems so doomed to conflict? Does it have any future? What holds it together? And what pulls it apart? Might it not be better to break it back into the constituent parts it was formed from and start again? I'm John Alterman, the Brzezinski Chair in Global Security and the Director of the Middle East Program at CSIS. To understand these questions about Iraq's future, we have to understand its past. Baghdad was created in 762 as the seat of the Abbasid Empire, which spanned from North Africa into present-day India. Baghdad was more than an imperial capital, however, for half a millennium. It became a global center of innovation in math, science, and the humanities. Greek texts from Plato, Aristotle, and Hippocrates, and more were preserved, translated, and studied by legions of Arab Muslims, Persians, and Christians who flooded in from all over the empire. Minorities thrived in Baghdad, and the city itself was designed by a Zoroastrian and a Jew. Baghdad remained a cosmopolitan place and the largest city of the medieval world for more than a century. Political infighting drove Baghdad into decline after several hundred years, and the city was finally sacked by the Mongols in 1258. Legend has it that on the day Baghdad fell, the Tigris River ran red and then black, red from the blood of the dead and black from all of the ink of the looted books dumped in the river. From that point on, the area that is now Iraq no longer projected power, but connected areas of power to each other. Iraq has many sources of connection to the surrounding areas. River systems, most notably the Tigris and the Euphrates, connect Iraq to Syria, to Turkey, and to Iran. Trade routes come out of the Arabian Peninsula and go through Damascus and Aleppo into the northern areas of Iraq and then into Iran and Central Asia. But Iraq not only connected power centers, it became a fuzzy boundary between the Arab world and the Persian. Shia Islam began in present-day Iraq in the 7th century, and the Shia holy cities of Najaf and Karbala remain cities of scholarship and pilgrimage throughout antiquity. The founding and the rise of Baghdad did not preclude Shia influence in the city. It found a place in Baghdad, as did many other religions, despite the presence of the Sunni Caliph there. The Safavid Empire adopted Shia Islam in 1501 in part to distinguish itself from the Ottoman Empire, which was Sunni. With the rise of Shia Islam in 16th century Safavid Persia, Isfahan and Qom rose too as Persian centers of Shia learning. But these cities did not eliminate Najaf and Karbala's influence. Instead, Shia Islam linked with them, creating what many consider a healthy competition between different schools of Shia religious thought. Even today, for many of the greatest Shia scholars, the choice is not between the holy cities of modern-day Iran and Iraq, but how to study in several of them. It's not a coincidence that the most prominent Shia cleric of today, Ayatollah Ali Sistani, was born in Iran, studied in Iraq, returned to Iran, and then returned to Iraq, where he now lives. His ancestors, many of whom were also distinguished clerics, had similar pedigrees. Sources suggest a massive conversion from Sunni to Shia Islam in southern Iraq in the areas around Basra in the 18th and 19th centuries, stemming from several factors. The first is immigration. The second is Shia in the shrine cities, seeking tribal protection from Wahhabis attacking from out of Saudi Arabia. The third is that as nomadic tribes settled into agriculture, the nomadic sheikhs gravitated to the more hierarchical aspect of Shiism to help preserve their influence. It's also possible that some adopted Shiism to avoid conscription. 
the important thing to note is that these divisions have been porous for 1400 years. The idea of a Shia south around Basra dates from the 19th century and not the 7th. Shiism links Iraq more broadly not only to Iran, but also to Lebanon and Bahrain and other countries of the Gulf. History shows us then that the sharp distinctions between Sunnis and Shia are a relatively recent phenomenon. And none of this is meant to suggest that Iraq was idyllic until the 1900s. Its history is replete with stories of rebellions, riots, and raids, many of which were based on identity. But the key point is this. Iraqi history has fewer clear lines than is commonly believed. In 1835, in one of its periodic efforts at reform, the Ottoman Empire created provinces centered around Mosul, Baghdad, and Basra. Mosul was arguably far more connected to Aleppo than to Baghdad, and while it had a large Sunni population, Mosul province contained large numbers of Kurds who had their own ideas about their political future. Basra, by contrast, was a trading port deeply connected to the Gulf, to India, and even farther afield in Asia. Baghdad was the most Persian of the major cities and also had some of the closest ties to Istanbul. With the addition of some unpopulated desert regions, these distinct parts became the post-World War I British mandate and then the state of Iraq. This became the traditional way of seeing the Iraqi map in three pieces. But look at it in more detail and we see a more diverse sectarian makeup in modern times. Baghdad has become a majority Shia city, but there are large numbers of Sunni Arabs. In Basra, you have large numbers of Shia, but also a significant Sunni population. In Kirkuk, large numbers of Kurds, but suddenly a large Turkmen population. In Mosul, large numbers of Sunni Arabs, but still many Kurds and a determinedly non-sectarian group. And each community is deeply linked to surrounding areas. So not only is the country a tapestry woven together, but that fabric is connected to surrounding communities, Sunnis to the west, Kurds to the north, Shia to the south and east. In the early 20th century, efforts to align state boundaries with sectarian identities went nowhere. It was in part because the Iraqi state wasn't especially relevant to most Iraqis' lives. In Basra in the early 20th century, there were only 10 primary schools generally staffed by one to two teachers each. There were two general high schools and no universities. In place of the state, most Iraqis were influenced by ethnic origin, religion, sect, profession, tribal identity, degrees of urbanization, and economic class. Iraqis quite simply were part of a larger tapestry to which the state was just a small part. At times, the groups united as reportedly happened in a broad revolt against British rule in 1920. But to a large degree, the state neither sought nor won affection for most of its citizens. This was about to change with the discovery of an important commodity. The power of the Iraqi state began to change with the rise of oil production. While it started slowly through the 20th century, oil wealth dramatically changed the distribution of power and authority began to flow from Baghdad out rather than from the periphery in. 1979 formalized what had been true for years. Saddam Hussein, who came out of the security apparatus of the Ba'ath Party, seized control. He increased the sectarian nature of Iraq, taking the non-distinct boundaries between Sunni, Shia, and Kurd, and he sharpened them, first by isolating the Kurds and then turning against the Shia. Saddam's actions weren't all about sectarianism, though. In part, it was a power play. Iraq's proven oil reserves are distributed unevenly, with about 17% in the north and about 75% in the south. Baghdad, the traditional center of Iraq, had the power, but not the oil. Oil poured out of the north and south, and power poured out of Baghdad. This was the world that Saddam Hussein helped create. Perhaps by design, and perhaps unavoidably, Oil came to completely dominate the economy of Iraq. Even after Saddam Hussein fell from power, 
the connection of oil to money, and by extension to political power, was an overwhelming feature of the economy. In 2011, oil production alone accounted for 53% of the country's GDP. But even that high number doesn't tell the whole story. Government spending, almost entirely derived from oil revenues, represented more than 20% of GDP, and government investment, another 11%. When all is said and done, the remainder of the economy produces only 14% of the GDP. The bulk is entirely tied to the government, which is completely tied to oil. Oil money came into a provincial capital with mud streets, stone walls, and ancient monuments. It built gleaming monuments to itself. Buildings inspired by fascist architecture rose with clean lines on a monumental scale. And many of those were monuments to the glory of the ruler as Saddam splashed his image over everything. Always heroic, always historic, always monumental, Saddam built Iraq's modernity into a vanity project. And oil made it possible. But in the clean lines of the Ba'ath Party's fascism and the monumental art it produced was something deeply ahistorical. The Iraq of the past was a tapestry, a multi-layered fabric of interwoven identities and textures. Traditionally, there were few clear lines in Iraq. In fact, the closer one looked, the more complexity one saw. In the world the Ba'athists made, the image of Iraq was intended to reflect purity and consistency. The closer one looked, the more purity one saw. Heightened sectarianism was part of this world. The architecture is all about the strong state, which for Iraq was an innovation. Now the state not only sought to control everything, but to advertise its control. Writing in 1989, the Iraqi British author Kanan Makia wrote about the fear that Saddam Hussein's regime commanded. Who's an informer? He asked. In Ba'athist Iraq, the answer is anybody. By 1980, the Ba'ath Party had over one million members who were expected to inform on all acquaintances, family members, and other party members. This was the state that oil enabled. Saddam's Iraq was isolated from its neighbors and the world, sanctioned and paranoid. After Saddam fell, Iraq's historic connections to its neighbors began to return, particularly in trade. In 2003, Iraqis barely traded with any of their neighbors, and that was partly because of international sanctions. After Saddam fell, trade increased to Turkey, to the United Arab Emirates, and to Syria. And trade continued to increase year after year, despite the rise in sectarian violence in 2006-2007, to where there's a huge amount of trade driven by the increased production of oil. Looking forward, there's no easy way ahead for Iraq. There's a historic Iraq of diversity and a historic Iraq of sectarianism. There's a historically weak state and a historically strong state. These precedents conflict. Iraqis will have to pick up these threads and weave their own future. And in doing so, they'll be carrying out an act of creation and not recreation. Whether they sustain a single state or multiple states is unclear but they cannot go back. I had an old friend, Anthony Shadid, who died in 2012 getting smuggled out of Syria. He was probably the greatest chronicler of Iraqis in the post-Saddam era. Writing in 2009, he described a wall almost two kilometers long dividing the Sunni and Shia residents of two adjoining districts in Baghdad. He quoted a 28-year-old soldier walking along the wall on the way to his base. These walls will be removed when the people of Iraq Finally wake up again, he said. And then Anthony describes some of the graffiti written on the wall. Long live the resistance, read a slogan scrawled on one segment. Someone had crossed out the word resistance and written Iraq. In that single scrawl lay the question for all Iraqis. What will their future be? Will it be about being against something? Or will it be about being for something? Iraqis haven't decided yet.
Thank you.